I also want to um, ish, uh, let you know that um, Mary Lou Abbott's memorial service will be held here on the same day at 11 a.m. So there'll be a time to greet the family at 10 a.m. And then you are invited to come for the worship service at 11 a.m. So once again, Mary Lou Abbott's memorial service will be held on Thursday, June 15th at 11 a.m. Like I said, I just got back from annual conference. Um, among the best annual conferences I have ever attended personally, although it began on a very low note with 14 disaffiliations um, and some, some challenging words. But um, for the most part, it was one of the smoothest, most peaceful, most loving, I'm not going to say it was one, it was the most smooth, peaceful, loving annual conferences I've ever attended in 25 years. Um, and it wasn't just because I was the sessions chair, <laughs> but, <laughs> but we have a bishop who is quite masterful at um, doing the work of the annual conference. So please pray for Bishop Peggy Johnson and keep her in your prayers as we move forward. My friends, that's all I have to report this morning. So let our worship begin.
Good morning, everyone. <clears throat> My name is Nancy Hammerton. I'm pleased to be the liturgist this morning. Our call to worship is Psalm 33, verses 1 through 8. You may find that in the back of your hymnal on page 767. 767. So will you stand as you are able and continue to stand through the reading from the gospel? Rejoice in the Lord, O you righteous. Delight in praise, O you upright. Praise the Lord with the lyre. Make melody to the Lord with the harp of ten strings. Sing to the Lord a new song. Play skillfully on the strings with loud shouts. God write us the word of the Lord. His work is done in faithfulness. The Lord loves righteousness and justice. The earth is full of the steadfast love of the Lord. And by the word of the Lord, the heavens were made, and all their host by the breath of God's mouth. The Lord gathered the waters of the sea as in a bottle, and put the deeps in storehouses. Let all the earth fear the Lord. Let all the inhabitants of the world stand in awe. Our hymn of praise is in the United Methodist Hymnal. Number 101, from all that dwell below the skies. Let's pray together our opening prayer. Beckoning God, you promise long journeys and new names. Call us out to risk holy adventure with unusual table companions. Linger with us so that we may be faithful disciples touching the fringe of your healing on behalf of all your children. The gospel reading today is Matthew 9, verses 9 through 13 and 18 through 36. As Jesus was walking along, he saw a man named Matthew sitting at the tax booth, and he said to him, follow me. And he got up and followed him. And as he sat at dinner in the house, many tax collectors and sinners came and were sitting with him and his disciples. 
When the Pharisees saw this, they said to his disciples, why does your teacher eat with tax collectors and, and sinners? But when he heard this, he said, those who are well have no need of a physician, but those who are sick. Go and learn what this means. I desire mercy, not sacrifice. For I have come to call not the righteous, but sinners. While he was saying these things to them, suddenly a leader of the synagogue came in and knelt before him saying, my daughter has just died, but come and lay your hand on her and she will live. And Jesus got up and followed him with his disciples. Then suddenly a woman who had been suffering from hemorrhages for 12 years came up behind him and touched the fringe of his cloak. For she said to herself, if I only touch his cloak, I will be made well. Jesus turned and seeing her, he said, take heart, daughter, your faith has made you well. And instantly the woman was made well. When Jesus came to the leader's house and saw the flute players and the crowd making a commotion, he said, go away, for the girl is not dead, but sleeping. And they laughed at him. But when the crowd had been put outside, he went in and took her by the hand, and the girl got up. And the report of this spread throughout that district. The word of God for us, the people of God. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God. At this time, may I please have the children? Good morning. Good morning. Hi. So, can anybody tell me what this is? Yes. Something doctors use to check how your heart is pumping? That is correct. It is something that doctors use to check how your heart is pumping. Does anybody know what the name of this device is? Any ideas? Do you have any ideas? Um, it makes your heart explode just in case there's a baby in your tummy. Hang on. <laughs> you see, see what, what she means is that uh, doctors can use one of these uh, when, uh, when a woman is pregnant to, to, to check on the baby, and they are so filled with joy that their heart metaphorically explodes. You see, that's... That's what's going on. So, so this is called a stethoscope, and um, it, it it is it, it's actually it, it's used by doctors, but it's also used by veterinary technicians. Uh, also, it checks your heartbeat. Yes, it checks your heartbeat too, and and it and this one uh, checks dogs' heartbeats. Uh, and th this 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 one belongs to my wife, and uh, uh, she she let me use the the one the she let me use the old one, yeah, uh, which which was wise. Uh, and and so 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 you know we yeah yeah you put the, you put the thing and yes yes my heart is beating. Cool. Yes, yes, we have a beating heart. Now, I brought this because, um, uh, so, so this, this belongs to a veterinary technician, and, uh, and, and, and why do you think people bring, say, a dog to a vet? 
Any ideas? You have one? Yes, it is. It is absolutely real. This is a real stethoscope. It is not a toy, and 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 and, and I, I promise I'm going to take care of it. Okay. Um, but what, what? Why would why would somebody bring a dog to a vet? Maybe to check how the heart is beating. Yes, yes, yes. Specifically to check how the heart is beating, but more generally, if the dog is sick, right? Why would we go to a doctor? Because we are? Yes, sick, because we're sick. And, you know, I'm talking about this because I, I, I got this. I got this. You've done really well. Let me let me take it from here. Is that cool? All right. Awesome. Uh, I mean, she she already I mean, she, she already gave us one one great devotion already. She really did. Um, so uh, you, yeah, we're not sick all of the time. Or are we? Because we're talking about the scripture today that we just read, where Jesus said this funny thing. He says, uh, 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 the, 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 the well don't need a doctor. It's the sick who need a doctor. And he said that because a bunch of, a bunch of people were mad at Jesus because he was hanging out with sinners. And he was being nice to sinners. And Jesus said, well, yeah, of course I am. Why do you think I'm here? Who do you think needs Jesus' love more? Really, really, uh, saints or sinners? Sinners. Correct. And you know what? We can take a lot of comfort in that. Because whenever we sin, when we do something bad, we know that we have Jesus. Jesus not only forgives us, but heals our hearts too. And that is good news. Cool? Let's pray. Milk. I got nothing. Milk. Milk. Yeah. That had nothing to do what. Mm. All right. <laughs> that, it, that, it, that, it, it could. It might. Let's pray. Oh, God, thank you for your healing love. Thank you for. We're, we're praying. Thank you for all that you do for us. Help us to be a source of your love that we might share it with the world so that everyone's hearts might be healed. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, uh, take off. And if you're going to Children's Church, that tall guy right there, Mr. Christensen, he is going to lead you back. All right.
A reading, a reading from the Old Testament scriptures. <clears throat> Excuse me. Now the Lord said to Abram, Go from your country and your kindred and your father's house to the land that I will show you. I will make of you a great nation, and I will bless you and make your name great, so that you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and the one who curses you, I will curse. And in you, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. So Abram went, as the Lord had told him, and Lot went with him. 
Abram was 75 years old when he departed from Haran. Abram took his wife, Sarai, and his brother's son, Lot, and all the possessions that they had gathered, and the persons whom they had acquired in Haran. And they set forth to go to the land of Canaan. When they had come to the land of Canaan, Abram passed through the land to the place at Shechem, to the oak of Moray. At that time, the Canaanites were in the land. Then the Lord appeared to Abram and said, To your offspring, I will give this land. So he built there an altar to the Lord, who had appeared to him. From there, he moved on to the hill country on the east of, on the east of Bethel and pitched his tent with, Beth, with Bethel on the west and I on the east. And there he built an altar to the Lord and invoked the name of the Lord. And Abram journeyed on by stages towards the Negev. May God bless this reading to our understanding. Good morning. That light is hot. So this morning during chime rehearsal, one of the children said to me, You're why is your head wet? <laughs> it's like it's hot. But I'm also I'm also kind of nervous. Like ordinarily when I preach, it's because uh, it's because the preacher's not here. She's here today, and 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 when we when we were sitting over here, uh, uh, when we first sat down, I was I, I was making little notes on my sermon because the sermon's never finished, and 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 I saw she was looking over at it, and I got so nervous. It, it was like it was like I was back in seminary. I'm like she's checking my theology. Oh my god. <laughs> anyway, glad you're here. Let's pray. Eternal God, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be acceptable to you, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. In Jesus' name and by the power of the Holy Spirit, amen. So, as is our custom, the church staff began our weekly meeting on Monday by reading and reflecting on the upcoming Sunday's scripture passage, which was the one we just read. And after a few moments, my first comment was, there's not a lot going on here, is there? And at first glance, that, that does seem to be true. It, it's all pretty straightforward. God said to Abram, pick up and leave. Abram said, all right. And then he and his wife, Sarai, went on a multi-city worship tour. The end. Word of God for the people of God. And the message, be like Abram. Listen to God. Nice and tidy. Later. <laughs> yeah, see, the Bible can be tricky like that because there's actually a lot going on here. And it's about as far from nice and tidy as you can get when you, can, when you consider where we are in the Bible. And in fact, that's kind of the point. So, see, Genesis 12 kicks off the Bible's historical narrative. Everything leading up to this was an allegory of humanity's primeval history, and it's intense. From creation to the expulsion from Eden to Noah's Ark to the Tower of Babel and the confusion of the world's languages, Genesis 1 through 11 gives an account of humanity's hopeless descent into depravity. This section also establishes important themes like the goodness of creation, the love of God, and the nature of sin, which stems mostly from hubris, and it hides God's presence. And despite God's attempts in these chapters to quell, mitigate, and correct human wickedness, we remain prideful, stubborn, violent, and arrogant. In short, we are a threat to ourselves. Okay, that was a really bleak way to start a sermon, I know. But, I mean, that's, 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 it's, where we, it's where we are. It's where we are. It's where we are in the sermon. It's where we are in the Bible. But, here's the good news. God has a plan. Enter 
Abram and Sarai, a couple to whom God will later give the new names of Abraham and Sarah because of reasons. And now we're going to run through their whole story. We're actually skipping the chapter where they get the, the, the new names, though, because that's also the chapter on circumcision. Uh, so for the sake of clarity, I'm just going to call them by their more familiar names. Cool? Cool. All right. God has a plan. Enter Abraham and Sarah. Abraham is a beloved biblical figure. He is regarded by three religions as a paradigm and paragon of faith, both template and role model. And who can argue? This is Father Abraham, the person God calls my friend, who faithfully packed up and left his homeland at God's command and who remained faithful to God's will, even when told to sacrifice his own son. Abraham, the epitome of faith. Wouldn't it be awful to wreck that image? I apologize in advance. Now, it is true that Abraham and his wife Sarah left their home at God's request. And it's true that he did not refuse when God told him to do something unthinkable. But when we read their whole story, we find out that Abraham and Sarah were just as broken as the rest of us, give or take. But you see, that's a good thing. Because this isn't a story about Abraham's faithfulness. It's about God's. And today's passage is where that story begins. It opens with a short poem, which might surprise some of you if you were reading along, because every English translation that I know of presents the call of Abraham as a poem, except one. And it's in our pews. That's unfortunate because whenever a poem is inserted into a biblical narrative, that's a cue. It means that passage has theological significance that goes way beyond here's what happened. And these three verses absolutely carries theological significance. Listen to the verses 2 and 3 again. It says, I will make of you a great nation, and I will bless you and make your name great so that you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and the one who curses you I will curse. And in you, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. Man, listen to all those blessings. It says some form of bless five times. And the really fun thing here is that it, that word means at least four different things in here. Isn't that, that's fun, right? Isn't that fun? Okay, I think it's fun. But this is, this is much more than a personal promise to Abraham. I mean, it is that, but, but it's, 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 it's way more. This is also the redemption plan for a fallen creation and its broken caretakers. Note the reason that God will make Abraham's name great, so that you will be a blessing. This isn't about him and Sarah. It's about being a blessing to the rest of the world. And the last line, in you, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. Who, who, who's that talking about? Who is that? Who's that talking about? You know it. No, no, no. What's the answer in church? Jesus, I heard it. Jesus. All the fam in you, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. That is a messianic foreshadowing. That's right. We are already anticipating Jesus and Abraham hasn't even put on his shoes. The opening, this opening poem is really fascinating when you get into the details of the Hebrew, but I do want to keep your attention. So trust me, I did my homework. This is a soaring threefold promise to both Abraham and and his descendants of land, protection, and a special relationship with the Lord. But this invitation to greatness, this calling, it's not to be accepted lightly. Remember that God is trying to reverse humanity's helpless descent into chaos, which means God needs a clean slate to work with. And when Abraham is told to go from your country, your kindred, and your father's house, that means he and Sarah are to forsake and abandon everything on which they depend and put their full trust in God's provision. That is a big ask. And interestingly, there is no indication that they were particularly qualified to be the recipients of this calling, nor are we given reason to think that they're unworthy of it. And the reason that we're not told about that is because it's not important. 
This story isn't about them. But it is a really good story, so I'm going to tell it, in, just in case you don't know it. Here, here's what happened, stylistically paraphrased. The God says, Abraham, you know the place where you live with your extended family and all your friends and all your stuff? Yeah, leave all of that. Head to this other place. I'll show you where to go. And when you get there, I've got huge plans. You, my friend, are going to be legendary. And I will always have your back. But for real, for real, just you and Sarah. Leave all your relatives behind. And Abraham says, okay. And he left. And he brought along his nephew, Lot. I'm going to repeat that. God said, you and Sarah, go, but leave everything else behind, including your family. So Abraham went and brought his nephew. Oh, yeah, he also brought all their stuff and all their servants on this journey. Quick question, how do you think this worked out? The short answer is poorly. See, the slightly longer but still very short answer is that the abundance of possessions he wasn't supposed to bring provoked animosity and conflict with the family he wasn't supposed to bring. And that led to them splitting, and that led eventually to Abraham getting involved in a war with a bunch of kings he didn't even know just to save the nephew that wasn't supposed to be there in the first place. And despite this disobedience, God did not forget the promises. And throughout the journey, God reminded Abraham of the promise through signs and visions by saying things like, your descendants will be as numerous as the stars in the sky or the dust of the earth. But for Abraham and Sarah, there was this one massive problem. They didn't have any kids. And Sarah was old, like, like way past the age of kid having. And so Abraham said to God, hey, I don't, I don't think this numerous descendants thing is going to work. But God said, hey, look, hey, trust me. I know what I'm doing. I'm God. And so Abraham said, well, okay, yeah, 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 cool, totally. I total, total trust, totally. But then Sarah kept on not having a kid. And she got frustrated. And she goes to her husband and says, look, we can't keep waiting on this God prom promise. So check it out. I've got this slave named Hagar. You're going to have a child with her, and that will be my child. And since soap operas hadn't been invented yet, Abraham didn't recognize this for the terrible idea that it was, and he took Sarah's slave, Hagar, who conceived and gave birth to a son named Ishmael. But you know what? That didn't work out as well as you think it might. Because, surprise, Sarah resented the woman with whom her husband had conceived and the child that, he, that she had with him. So they banished them and sent them into the wilderness. Now don't worry. Not only did God look after Hagar and Ishmael in the wilderness, Israel, Ishmael's descendants will show up in chapter 37 and inadvertently save Abraham's great-grandchildren from starving in a famine. Ha! <laughs> what a wild turn of events, right? Back to the matter at hand, though. Even after the blatant disregard for God's promise, God once again reiterates the promise. This time through these three angels who visit Abraham and tell him with the utmost certainty that Sarah would conceive. So, you know, chill out with the slave taking. And when Sarah heard that, she laughed out loud. And that, that didn't sit well with God. God came to her and said, hey, hey, why are you laughing? And Sarah said, uh... I didn't, I didn't laugh. And God said, yeah, yeah, you did. That, 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 it's, that's re it's really an uncomfortable moment. Like when you read that part, you're like, oh my God. Here's another uncomfortable moment. But moving on though, a little later, when Abraham and Sarah arrive in a land called Gerar, we get this very awkward and off-putting sequence of events. It starts because Abraham is scared that the people there will kill him when they see how good-looking his wife is. For real, that was the thinking. I did not make that up. But rather than trusting God's promise of protection, he's like, I got a plan. Does anybody know what the plan was? What? What? Yes, exactly. Yes, yes. He pretended Sarah was his sister instead of his wife. Foolproof. <laughs> How do you think that turned out? The short answer is poorly. 
And this is actually a repeat of a previous poor decision. So it's even worse. Like for real, this happened in Egypt before. They, they tried the, no, she's really my sister thing once before. And in neither of these episodes did Abraham fully trust God's promises and instead relied on his own wisdom. And in both episodes, God had to actively step in to prevent Sarah from becoming a king's concubine. That's how poorly the plan went. And then he tried it again. And yet, God protected Abraham and Sarah because God promised to do so. And God keeps promises. Speaking of God keeping promises, do you know what happened next? Sarah had a baby. She had a baby, and she named him Isaac, which means... Laughter. Excuse me. I'm going to pause here for a minute to talk about grace. Because at this point, God's promises of protection and progeny have been fulfilled. God has proven faithful, and in return, God has only asked one thing of Abraham. Faith. To trust that God will continue to faithfully keep the promises made. And to be fair... There were a few moments where Abraham and Sarah exhibit radical trust, but most of what we've seen since their initial call has been a 10-chapter failure narrative that through language and symbolism repeatedly mirrors Adam and Eve's choice to reject God's wisdom. But God did not use any of Abraham and Sarah's failures to nullify the covenant or take back any promises. And that is because grace comes First, grace is not a reward. Grace is a gift. And faith is not a condition for grace, but a response to it. This is a consistent theme throughout the Bible. On day six of creation, God didn't say, I'll make humans in my image on the condition that they behave themselves. No, God gave us the blessing of divine image. Grace came first. When the Israelites were slaves in Egypt, God didn't say, I'll rescue you if you follow the Ten Commandments. No, God rescued them from Egypt and then gave them the law. Grace came first. The Apostle Paul went from being the church's biggest persecutor to its greatest evangelist. But Jesus didn't wait until Paul had written half the New Testament to forgive him. It was God's forgiveness that inspired Paul's faith. Grace came first. Grace always comes first. Always. And that's because God believes in us. Always. We are broken and sinful humans with limits and limitations, but God's love and power is infinite. And so despite our brokenness, God continually calls us out from the cycle of sin that keeps us from embracing our true identities as children of the living God. And with that in mind, let's go back to Abraham. As we have said, large, uh, Abraham has largely failed his test so far. And now comes the final exam. Having kept all his promises, especially the impossible one where God gave them a child, God called upon Abraham and Abraham responded saying, Here I am. This is a significant phrase in Scripture because it indicates faithfulness. And it usually signifies a turning point. Jacob, Moses, Isaiah, Mary, and a host of other biblical figures all spoke this phrase at pivotal moments in response to God's call, and their response was bold faithfulness. So when Abraham said, here I am, it meant he was finally ready to listen. And then came the gut punch. God said to him, I want you to sacrifice your son. Go and take Isaac up to this mountain, build an altar, and sacrifice him. And you know what? He went. He took Isaac up to the top of Mount Moriah. And on the way, Isaac asked where they were going to get this animal for the sacrifice that God had commanded. And Abraham told him God would provide. And at the top, they built an altar. Abraham tied up his son, laid him on the altar, took out his best son-killing knife, and suddenly an angel of the Lord called out to him, Abraham! You know what Abraham said? 
here I am. He knew. At this point, it says, Abraham looked up and saw a ram caught in some thorns. You know, God had once specifically told Abraham to look up at the stars to see how numerous his descendants would be, but he didn't. He didn't look up. Instead, he demanded a sign for assurance that God would provide. God obliged, but up on the mountain, on Mount Moriah, he looked up and saw that God had provided. At long last, something turned out pretty well. After sacrificing the ram as an offering to God, Abraham named that place Jehovah Jireh, which means the Lord will provide. And because of this episode, Abraham is revered for his faith. Now, I recognize that there is an obvious and understandable objection to praising the faith, the faith of a man who was about to murder his son without even trying to argue. I have, I have, I have two responses to that. One is simple, and the other is the one you should care about. The first is that Isaac was never going to die that day. Either Abraham was going to change his mind or God was going to stop him. Despite the look of it all, Isaac was not actually in any danger, but that doesn't resolve the issue of Abraham's intent. Here's the thing about that. When Abraham said, here I am, it meant that he had worked through his doubt and fully trusted God's promise. And God's promise, which was repeated numerous times, was not only that Abraham's descendants would be too many to count, but also that it would be through Sarah's son Isaac that this promise was kept. And Isaac wouldn't fulfill that role if he was dead. Because he believed God's promise, Abraham knew that his son Isaac would not die, and all he had to do to make sure was kill him. He didn't know exactly what would happen, but he did know that the Lord would provide. And that is a huge turnaround for the dude we met back in chapter 12. So let's go back to that chapter. And you know, I can agree that maybe, just maybe, I was a little unfair in my portrayal of Abraham and Sarah. After all, to forsake and abandon everything on which they depend for a leap of faith is not a small request. They could have said no and lived a pleasantly uneventful life in the Fertile Crescent. And who could blame them? I mean, after, uh, all Abraham had was the, was the word of a little-known deity. He didn't have a fully formed Bible to look to for guidance or understanding. He didn't have 4,000 years of Judeo-Christian tradition, philosophy, and practice. He didn't have the inspiration of this fledgling religious sect that flourished into a worldwide faith community. We have those things. Abraham didn't. And no, he didn't always listen. No, he didn't always trust. And yes, that got him into a lot of trouble. But maybe the point isn't that he needed to be perfect. Maybe the point was that he showed up. Abraham and Sarah made some lousy and selfish decisions. But when God called, man, they showed up. Sinful and broken, they showed up. And they kept showing up. And because they kept showing up, God was able to work through them and do something awesome. And even better, as they walked with God, their broken souls started to heal. So now, let's look at us. Here we are. Each of us has left our homes to come here to this place on this Sunday morning. That is not an accident. It is not random. And although it is not as dramatic as Abraham, we absolutely were called here by the grace of God because Despite our brokenness, God has big plans to work through us, sinful and broken us, to help bring about the new creation. I believe that. In fact, I know it. But you got to show up. Even if it means we get things wrong sometimes. We know that the Holy Spirit can and does work through broken and sinful people to do great things, but only when they show up. Faith cannot be passive. Your faith cannot be something that you do on the side and expect great things to come from it. 
Make no mistake, Jesus Christ, the Messiah, teaches plainly that our faith will accomplish even greater things, and it will instill our hearts with peace, as it is written, the peace that surpasses all understanding. The new creation, greater things, the peace of God, these are the promises that come with the call to Christianity. So there's really just one question. Do we believe it? Do we believe that? Or do we still think that we need to manufacture our own blessings? Actually, there is one more question. There is one more. There's not just one. There's, there were two questions. That was, a, that was a pump fake. And I think it will help us to answer the first one. That question is, how do I know that we're called? How do I know that we're called? Why am I, so, why am I so sure that we are called? Well, you know what? I'll tell you why. Uh, you see, the Greek word from which we get the church is ekklesia, which is a compound word that literally means the ones who are called forth. The, 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 the word church means those who are called. And who is the church? Oh, yeah? Amen. Please be seated, although you already are. Funny how you pick up on those things after some time, huh? Um, first of all, I never question your theology. <laughs> I'm just wondering what the angle is going to be. That's all. It's my curiosity. I have a tendency to look over and check it out. I just want to know what the angle is going to be. That's all. Ah. Uh, what a blessing. Thank you so much, Zach. The only thing I come away with is Zach needs to preach more. We have several uh, concerns this morning. One is that um, Kathy Burke um, is back from um, a short stay at Emerson Hospital, and she is requesting healing prayers. She misses being able to worship with us, and we miss her being here. So prayers for Kathy Burke. And also, Ivor Brown had surgery last Sunday at Emerson. She's doing well and is expected to be home by the end of the week. So 
please pray for her recovery. Also, we have a celebration. Um, we want to continue to pray for this year's confirmands. Aiden, Kieran, Jack, Jasper, Min, Sarah, and Serafina. As you saw last week, they are a mighty group of people. Last week, we vowed to increase their faith and confirm their hope and perfect them in love. And may we all find ways to keep doing this, to keep loving them, to keep surrounding them. I kind of added to that prayer a little bit. But I want to thank um, the person who submitted this prayer concern as well. I also have a prayer concern for our, from one of our kiddos. Um, they want to pray for others and myself. Thank you for making my life and my parents. So we have all of those prayers this morning. Let's take some time to breathe. If you want to, close your eyes and get into a position that is comfortable for you. Relax your arms, put your feet on the ground, whatever is best and most comfortable for you as you take a big, long breath in. I suggest you count for seven to breathe in. Feel your lungs expanding and your ribs growing and hold that breath for a count of four. And then slowly exhale. Let's do that again and breathe in all that is good and holy and all that you heard about faith and going forth in faith even when you doubt and wonder and think maybe God has left you. You, God, swirling and changing spirit, you, God, call us to go. Go from our country, go from our kindred, go from our land, go far away from everything we have ever known, our support system, our family, our way of living. Give it all up and go. You call us, God, to a new land, a new place, or simply a new way of being, sometimes a new way of loving, a new future, a new world. You call us, God, to live on after the loss of a beloved parent or spouse or child. You call us to go on after a devastating diagnosis or disease. You, Spirit, that we know is so loving and so consistent and so constant, you lead us into places that seem dark and unknown, and we become confused and lost, and we are so unsure. God, we pray for Kathy Burke as she recovers from her time at Emerson. And we ask for her healing as we do Iva Brown and for her healing as well. God, we are also missing one of our worship leaders this morning, Rob Hammerton, who fell and is 
in immediate care now, determining if anything is broken or bruised or battered. But we pray for his healing this day as well. God, we pray for our confirmants. Those newest members of our community who are just such a wonderful bunch of people. God, we all pray for each other and for making our lives and those of our parents, siblings, spouses, family, extended family. Thank you, God. Thank you for it all. God, we pray this morning for our gay and lesbian siblings who have been hurt too often in this world. And we ask that the hand that we stretch out might be enough for them to trust again, particularly during this Pride Month. God, the people of the United Methodist Church, particularly throughout the U.S., as about 15% of our churches choose to leave the denomination, we wonder what it might be like without them. Our prayers continue to go up for the people of Ukraine and Sudan and all the nations where war and violence are commonplace. We pray, God, for our own nation and our leaders, as well as the young people who work to defend it. We pray for all of these things, God, in the sure knowledge that you call us and you never, ever leave us. And when you call us, you stand by us even when we're not so sure, even when we depend on our own devices, even when we decide, oh God, this isn't going to work. I thought you called me to this, but maybe I need to do something about it. Even when we act like Abraham and Sarah, even when we take along the things we're not supposed to take along, even when we don't listen to the instructions quite as well as we ought to. Help us, God, to remember that when you call us, you stand by us, and nothing, nothing, no nothing, can ever separate us from you. And now let us pray together the prayer that Jesus taught us, saying together, Our parent, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. But deliver us from evil, for yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen.
and now we will have a stewardship moment where we will recognize our high school graduates. So we are going to invite all of our high school graduates to come forward. We do have three other graduates, and I am remiss for actually not getting their names listed in the bulletin announcements uh, because I, I really like this class. They're, each of them, each of them is, is, is pretty great. So I'll get those names in the announcements next week and on our social media. But, but since the ones who are here are Catherine and Sarah, uh, I'm going to brag on them for a minute. Uh, these, 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 two, these two are incredible. I've told their, I've told their parents. I've told them, like, <laughs> seriously. Uh, I remember, I should have used a handheld mic so I could look at them, but yeah, it's probably easier this way. Uh, I remember you as seventh graders, and, and even though I liked you when you were seventh graders, I did not see you developing into like these awesome leaders. Although I should have, because as eighth graders, you were the ones who made all of the other middle school youth comfortable. Jill remembers, remember, didn't, didn't they? Yeah, you made, they made your kid comfortable. Yeah, for real. Uh, you've been an incredible influence on the younger youth and on me, so thank you. And in return for this, we're going to give you a blanket. <laughs> and, 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 and if their families would come up uh, to, 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 because we're going we're gonna to pray for them, and, and, and the families were going to wrap the blankets around their shoulders. And while you make their way forward, in particular while Christy is making her way forward, uh, here's this other thing. We're, we're, I'm, there's, there's, a, there's a double blessing today because uh, uh, Christy is, is, is going to be our Sakahachi chaperone. Catherine and Sarah are going to Sakahachi, but they're not going to be here. They're going to be out of town on the day that, that, that we actually bless the Sakahachi team. And so uh, we're going to combine this prayer. Uh, so it's going to be it's going to be a blessing for Sakahachi. It's going to be commissioning and a blessing. Yeah. yeah. Lee can handle that. She's a pro. Yeah. She's a pro. All right. So. And as they're unwrapping their blankets, I just want to note each of these blankets is red. Red is a significant color in the liturgy in the world of the church because it is the color of, not Jesus, Jesus is not the answer this time. <laughs> it's the color of Pentecost. That's right. So Pentecost is the coming of the Holy Spirit. We hope you think of the Holy Spirit every time you wrap yourself up in this. Or maybe you'll just think that you're we're cold and now you're warm. I don't know. It all works. Yes, Kate. Yes. It's really cold. It's really cold. Ah, <laughs> oh, they look beautiful on you. Okay. I'm going to put my hands on your shoulders so I don't want to frighten you. Okay. Loving and gracious God, we give you thanks for these two beautiful young women. We give you thanks for all that they have become as they have grown, as they have learned, as they have studied. And we know, God, that this is only the beginning of the beautiful place that you are calling and leading them to. Help them, God, to trust you and to trust your call, just as you called Abraham, and to know that when things don't always go according to plan, when they take matters into their own hands, that you are there with them always, always, because nothing, no, nothing can separate us from the love of God. So we bless their graduation, and we ask God for you to be with them as they do wonderful, wonderful mission work in Sagahatchee, we know, God, you are there. You are there no matter what. We pray all of these things in the name of Jesus Christ, your child, and our beloved Savior. Amen. Thank you.
And now, will the ushers come forward? As we bring our offerings to you, we give back to you from the abundant blessings you have given us. May our gifts be acceptable in your sight, O Lord our God, 
and grant that our whole life may give you glory and praise through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. So we're about to sing our hymn of commitment. It's number 569. We have a story to tell the nations. Our short story is going to be short this morning. We're going to sing one verse. Friends, go now in peace, listening for the word of God, knowing that God can and will call you, listening and hoping that your response might be exactly what God has called you to do. But if it's not, going forth with the confidence that God will make all things right. Go in peace, my friends. Amen. extra notes always a good thing always a good thing friends this has been a long day it's time for some of you to go i'm actually going to invoke the uh sort of special post food rule, post food rule uh if you need to go you can surely go but we're going to have zach go down to carolina this week to receive a very important distinction he will receive his deacon status from the United Methodist Church. And the choir, and the choir, thanks to Rob and his fine arranging, would like to sing him a song to send him on our way. That is our post of today. If you want to stay and listen to it, by all means stay. If you got to get that cup of coffee, go now. Mm -hmm.